Good morning. Good morning. I just love that song, King of Kings. I really do. We sing it a lot in the car as we're driving to and from places. I'm so happy you're here, and uh, I'm, we're happy to be with you again this Sunday. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Joseph Orr. I am a, a deacon at Westside Baptist Church, and uh, I've been coming here. To, this is the third time, so hopefully it's a charm. And just sharing a gospel word with you today. Uh, my wife and kids are here, and I'm grateful for them being with us today as well. Um, Phyllis, I got a text from Phyllis a couple weeks ago, a couple Sundays ago, and I heard the great news about Justin Thompson and his family. We've been praying for you all to find a pastor, and um, you know, praise the Lord, praise the Lord for that. So we are so happy. Our life group has been following the progress of your church, and uh, we're just so grateful for what the Lord has provided to you all, and we're. We are praying for safety for Mr. Thompson and his family to come as soon as he can, as soon as he can. But today we are going to be in a wonderful little book of the Bible, uh, the letter from 1 first, first John. 1 uh, John is only five chapters long, but they are packed full of stuff. And we're only going to talk about four verses today because it's deep. So we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And I want to introduce a couple things about this letter because it can be confusing at times if you're not aware of John's style. And I just want to make sure we're all together as we're walking through this uh, today. First, John is the author. There are so many connections between the gospel of John and this letter, the, the meanings between light and dark and hearing and seeing, equally believing. You have to, it almost is assumed that you have heard the Gospel of John, according to John, right? So uh, keep that in mind. There's lots of connections there. Also, this letter was sent to a specific group of people. Now, sometimes in letters it said, to the Romans, to the church in Ephesus, to this and that. Um, this one is what we would call a circular letter. And what does that mean? It's a letter that you, it's meant to be shared. So... The letter to the Corinthians, while it was shared, was addressing stuff in the Corinthian church particularly, and of course those teachings can be broadened out. This, this letter is meant to go to several churches, probably in Asia Minor, um, where he had a lot of influence and time spent there as an elder. Um, so that's important to understand, that these are meant for a specific group of people, so they're believers, they're churches, and they're struggling with something. And it's important to know that. Uh, some of these things they're struggling with are false teachers and false teachings that's crept in. Um, some of these things they're teaching with is, if you go into the letter, you'll hear this term, the Antichrist, or spirit of the Antichrist. These people who aren't believers that are causing a disruption in the unity and fellowship of the body of the church. So there's just, uh, there's a couple other things too that's important, but uh, when I'm back here in July, we'll go into that more, because we'll... Uh, have the, church, the verses to back it up. All right, question for you. Who's heard the phrase, old wives' tale? Raise your hand. Sure, everyone, right? Raise your hand if you've heard this tale before. Um, you can't swim until you've had 30 minutes after eating, right? Right, okay. I was told that. I was told that. Uh, who's been told or who's heard, if you cross your eyes for too long, they'll get stuck that way? <laughs> now, who said this to kids? If you make that face, it's going to be like that forever, right? I said that to my kid just last week. Um, who's heard this? It takes seven years to digest a piece of gum. That's why you don't swallow it, right? Who's heard, coffee stunts your growth, right? Who's heard humans only use 10% of their brains? Okay, yeah. Uh, don't go outside with wet hair, you'll catch a cold. I didn't hear that much, my hair's basically been this short my whole life, it dries quick, but I'm sure others, maybe not so much. See, these are things that people say and they repeat over and over and over again, and we can all smile and laugh because there may be a little bit of truth, like for the swimming one. You know, technically, you're not going to die if you go swimming right after you eat. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a little cramp, and you deal with it. You move on. But it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to end your life. 
So there's tiny nuggets in these little wives' tales, but they're not really true. But these are things you, people say, and you've heard it so much that we just assume it's true. We just assume it's true. But what I want to talk to you today is much more important than just an old wives' tale. Um, what is not an old wives' tale is that our Lord and King Jesus Christ is real, he's sitting on his throne in heaven, and that he commands you and me and every single person in this world to believe. And so our main idea today is this. I want you to know that your faith is real. That's our main idea today, that you know your faith is real. So I'm going to read the text. It's only four verses, so it won't be long. Uh, we're in 1 John chapter 1, starting at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we had seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. But we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Amen to that. So our main idea, I want you to know that your faith is real. And the first point is, you need to know that Jesus is real. Jesus is real. What is the that in verse 1? What is the that which was from the beginning? And of course, if you've read the Gospel of John, it starts off from the beginning, right? And you can think of all those allusions. We'll get there. But that's not what that is in verse 1. That is in verse 1. The gospel proclamation. That is the gospel, which is from the beginning. And what is John trying to say here? The gospel message has not changed. It is the same as it was in the beginning. It's the same as to the church he's writing to. And the gospel message is the same that we proclaim today. There is, he's also saying this, that there is a stability in the message of the gospel. That this message, if we book when we believe that Paul wrote this, this message that is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Romans 1, verse 18. That is the gospel. That which is from the beginning. All right? It's important to know that. This gospel is the same from each of the apostles. The gospel that John shared, that Paul shared, that Peter shared, that all the other people throughout the history of this church that got to you, it's the same gospel. The same gospel. And I'm going to read a couple of verses to you just to show this to you. And this is from Peter, who is not the Apostle John. But in Acts chapter 10, verse 36 through 44, I'll read it to you. Paul, uh, Peter is saying this to the Gentiles, to Cornelius, you may have heard of him before. And Peter says this. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news and of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know that happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are all witnesses of all that he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us, who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins throughout, through his name. That's the gospel that Peter taught. That's the gospel that John spoke. That's the gospel that Paul spoke. And every other disciple from 2,000 years ago to today. That is the gospel that was from the beginning. So we, we made it very far. We made it five words, four words. Uh, verse 1, from the beginning, we continue. 
which we have heard, which we have heard as we continue on. Who is the we? We have to understand this. Who is the we? John's writing this letter to the church just here to be spread around. So the we reference would be the apostles or the people who um, have seen in the words of Jesus. Now, if he had stopped there, you could have argued that this was secondhand knowledge. Oh, I heard from a friend of a friend on Tuesday, and from another friend on Tuesday, from another friend, this is the gospel. But John continues, all right? John is building evidence that the proclamation that he is sharing with the church is not man-based, but instead comes from Jesus Christ himself. He continues, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon. So he's heard it, he's seen it, He's adding another sense, literally a sense of the five senses, to this evidence of the quality of John's proclamation. He's telling us that not only did he hear the words of Christ, but he was there with Christ to see him. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus and Paul had this moment on the road and changed Paul's life forever? That's what we're talking about. John is saying, I have heard these things. I have seen these things. He continues. John continues. And we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Another aspect, he just adds this, of the intimate knowledge of Jesus, okay? So maybe some people had seen Jesus, and maybe some people have heard what Jesus said, but not everyone was there when Jesus appeared after the resurrection. I'm going to point you to Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Jesus says to his disciples, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. See, John was there. He heard Jesus. He seen Jesus. He was there to touch the wounds and verify it was Jesus before him and not someone else. That is where this message comes from. This testimony, this proclamation of the gospel is not just a message. While it is a message, there is a declaration. But this gospel is embodied in Jesus himself. It's an embodiment. And a final aspect that we need to look at for knowing that Jesus is real, we move on to verse 2. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. Now look, the word of life that was with the Father. Now, when you think of first the Gospel, chapter 1, John, from the beginning, Right? Verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. See, Jesus was a real person, flesh and blood, seen and heard and touched. In that Luke chapter, he even asked the apostles or the disciples at the time for some food because he was hungry. I don't know how much more human that can get. But Jesus is also God. From the beginning, before the world was created, Jesus was there with God. And all things have been made through Jesus. And life, life flows from Jesus to those who believe. The eternal life comes from Jesus. So, Jesus is a real person. Jesus is also God. And Jesus is eternal. With all this evidence, he was seen, he was heard, he was touched, and he's been there from the beginning. Jesus is real. And that's our main idea. One of our main ideas, know that your faith is real. In order to know that, you have to know that Jesus is real. That's point one. Point two. That in order to know your faith is real, you have to know that the result of your faith is real. Let's unpack that. 
In verse 2, I'll read it again. The life must have been made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and made manifest to us. See, it's, it's important when we read the Bible and we see the same kind of words back to us. When, when the Bible, the writers and the authors of the Bible books, they say the same things again and again, that's a clue that's important, right? There's other clues, too. When there's a therefore, you have to ask the question, what is the therefore for? Well, when we see that, again, John writes, we, test if we have seen it, and he uses the same word manifest twice in a sentence. So this is the second time John has mentioned seeing Jesus, the embodiment of the gospel, the God, King, and of course man. Then we move on to verse 3. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the third time John has brought up that they have seen and heard. And so I went back. It wasn't hard. It was only three verses. Just to recap, he, they have heard. That word is used twice. They have seen. That was used three times. Touched one time. And the word manifested, which basically means all three of those senses, two times. John, in this literary work here, is saying, like, this person is real. Jesus is real. What you built your lives upon is real, church, that I'm writing to. See, John is emphasizing the truthfulness of his proclamation, and that G John has proclaimed Jesus Christ to them. Not an old wives' tale. Not something that people have just said. Someone who was there, who's been seen, who's been heard, who's been touched who was killed on a tree and raised again. That's the proclamation. I want you to notice something in verse 3. He says something very interesting. <clears throat> he says, We proclaim this also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. So, John proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that they, would, they being the church audience, would have a relationship or fellowship with the apostles and with these believers and, of course, other believers elsewhere. And then further, as we read on, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. John unites not only the readers and the apostles, he unites you and me, he unites us all to 2,000 years of believer's history. He takes that entire group, and then he says, Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son. I want to point you to our great high priest prayer, Jesus. That was recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 19 through 21, and I'll read it to you. Jesus at this time is praying for his disciples, and he says, And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask for these only, but only though for those who will believe in me through the word. Folks, that's us. Our high priest in the garden is praying to his disciples, for his disciples, and then he prays for us. And what does he pray that happens? That they may all be one. And Jesus says this in the same verse. Just as you, Father, are in me. Just as you, Father, are in Jesus. And I in you. So Jesus in the Father. That they may also be in us. We have been united to this relationship, this fellowship with God and Jesus. And we understand the relationship between God the Father and Christ the Son. We understand that they're connected, that they're will, they love each other, they serve each other, they obey. We have been entered into that relationship. Now you could ask the question, what does fellowship mean? And if you look at the word and you follow it through, 
means a personal relationship with each other and with God. So, personal relationship. That becomes our identity as Christians. So John starts this letter off as a foundational point for the believers to understand, no matter the hardships they're having, their identity, their identification is not who they are, it's who they're in fellowship with. In this way, you can be assured in that you, in fact, know God because you're here. You, in fact, know God because you believe in the gospel, because you have been united. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism, or anyone else's baptism, depending on how long ago it was, right? Anyone's baptism, we tell this story. We say, look, you have been united in Christ's death as you go down into the water, and you have been united in his life as you come up. You are in fellowship. We are in fellowship with the eternal God. It also has to ask this question, who does not have a fellowship with God? Who does not? The unbeliever, the unregenerate, the rebels against God. The Bible calls them children of wrath. And the truth is, is that all of us have been in that state. We do not come into this world a believer. Now, all of us are born under Adam and in Adam, and so we have a sin nature, we have a heart of stone, we have this desire to rebel against God. At some point in your life, depending on God's plan for you, it could have been when you were six, it could have been when you were 60, at some point, something changed. And how did you come into that fellowship? By the grace of God, through faith and the gospel message. That message that is this, that the declaration that God has defeated the powers of sin and death, and that he has saved sinners through his perfect life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And that by grace alone, through faith alone, the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed to sinners. And when you believe who Jesus is and have faith in Jesus, he did all those things. And he is who you've been entered into a relationship with, a fellowship. Folks, the results of your faith are real. Your faith is a real thing. Your faith is a gift from God, and the result of that is you have been united with Christ. If you understand the words of John 6, verses 37 through 39, he says this, All that the Father gives me, this is Jesus speaking, so all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Let's say that again. All that the Father gives to me, and whoever comes to me, well, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that was given to me, but raise it on the last day. God has given you to Jesus, and Jesus will not cast you out, but raise you on the last day. And this is the work of the eternal God, the promise keeper. We are told to have faith. God is faithful. Verse 4. We are writing these things so our joy may be complete. John writes to his audience so that his and their joy That's a funny phrase, somewhat, because you know it sounds a little self-centered. Because I'm writing this into you so that I have joy and you have joy, not just that you have joy. But the reality is this: the, po the proclamation of the gospel produces a fellowship in the eternal life with God and Jesus, and in turn, that fellowship in the eternal life produces joy. We 
we see this idea written by Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. I'll read it to you. He says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything is worthless compared to knowing Christ. Brothers and sisters, regardless of your situation, where you find yourself, you cannot lose the most valuable thing in the universe. You cannot lose what Christ has done for you. You can lose your house. You can lose your family. You can lose your car. But you cannot lose Jesus. You can lose your money. You can lose your freedom and your reputation. But you cannot lose Jesus. See, John, see, when Paul wrote those words I just read to you, that I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, he was in prison. This is why our faith is real. Because Christ is the foundation of our lives, and Christ is who carries us to the end and then to eternity. From the moment we believe, we have been as died in Christ and raised in Christ. And because Jesus is real, the result of your faith is real, you can know that your faith is real. So what do we do? So John starts his letter off building a foundation for everything that he's going to say after this. To remind them of who they are, Christians. To remind them of what God has done for them. And that is the basis of what she says to do everything else. So I think that's a good application. Brothers and sisters, we are Christians. We have been given this gift of freedom and salvation. And not because we're better than anyone else. No, we know our sins. We know that we are the most terrible person we know. We know that we don't deserve this gift that God has given us by his mercy and his grace. And so because we know these things, we know that we know that God has loved us, that we can love each other. That we can serve each other, that we can sacrifice for each other. Because God sacrificed for us, we can sacrifice because our station is secure. See, I call these get-tos and have-tos. What do I mean by that? I don't like getting up early in the morning to go to work. I have to do that. But if we're going fishing and I have to get up early, I get to do that. It's amazing how your motivation changes, right? What do I mean by get-tos and have-tos? Before God has saved you and you, have, you had to do the law of God perfectly. So you had, you had to love one another perfectly. You had to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if you didn't, spoiler, no one did, then you are condemned. That's the law. But then God, from the beginning, made a path that if you would believe in the work and person of Jesus Christ, that he would take his righteousness because you know what Jesus did? Jesus did the law, actively and passively obeyed every single idea of the law, that he loved other people, that he followed the commandments. He did that in his life, and his righteousness is through the completion of God's law. And so what happens when you believe in Jesus is that it's like a coat. You could may have heard this before. A robe, a white robe has been wrapped around you it is like you have done Jesus' righteousness when you have faith in what he's done. You see, he covers you in this cloak, this jacket, this protective shell. And then what he does is he takes your sins that you have done, that you will do, all of it, and he puts it onto him. And that he paid the punishment for those sins because our God is just and righteous. See, and now we get to love one another. Now we get to love God. Now we get to sacrifice for our friends and our community and our strangers that we know, that we interact with. 
We get to, because we don't have to, we get to get up early and go fishing. We get to get up early and serve our neighbors. We get to get up and struggle and persevere, all because even if we fail, brothers and sisters, God is still there and you are still covered by his righteousness. Brothers and sisters, I think it's important that every week we finish up and that if there's one thing you had to do or got to do according to this sermon application this week, is that you get to focus on Jesus Christ. You've been awakened to what he has done for you. Your eyes have been opened. Your heart of stone has been changed to a heart of flesh. He has changed your spirit and your desire. So you get to focus on Jesus Christ. And through that, you can love, serve, sacrifice, care for one another. At this time, we're going to have a um, time of invitation. I invite anyone who would join me down here if you want to pray with me. If you have been moved by the gospel and what God has done and that you repent and believe in the man, God, Jesus Christ, you would join me down here. Otherwise, if you would pray as we're listening to this song, if you would pray for those who don't believe, to pray for our community that God would open their hearts and open their minds and that they would come into fellowship with us and with the Father